Oh, good day, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Crowcast Weekend Wrap. Uh, not quite as happy as last week, but uh, plenty to talk about still, so we won't waste any time. We'll crack straight into it, shall we? G'day, 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 and welcome to a, another edition of the Weekend Wrap, round two of the Weekend Wrap, and uh, <laughs> Nikki, you're looking a little <laughs> bit grumpy there. <laughs> what have you done to me? I've just put your name under Macca, which is weird. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just what get a... rid of that real quick, just to save your... Uh... <laughs> I, I never saw That's it. It's pretty funny. <laughs> uh, sure I'll, try and fix, it. I'll try and fix that. In a second, uh, where am I? Uh, look, good day to everyone who's joined us I'm in late. the chat, and uh, who's joined us on YouTube, and who's joined us on Twitch, and who's joined us on Spreaker, and everything's up and running. The website's back up and running after being severely hacked by some mongrel in Russia, uh, which is why it wasn't working. But uh, ended up getting that back on deck, which is great. And uh, Nick, how are you? <laughs> Well, um, my voice is still not recovered from last week. <laughs> yeah, there, there was a bit that. of yelling at the television yesterday. Yeah. A bit of yelling at the women's game today, which was yeah. a very nice end to the weekend. Yeah, um, I didn't. Unfortunately, I didn't see the uh, the girls' game, but uh, they got up, thankfully, which was yeah. great. Great, great pressure game. Really yeah. great and, pressure game. And it puts them on top of the ladder, doesn't it? Yep, week off prelim. Fantastic. Um, and well and deserved finished too. third. We bumped them down to third as well. So oh, Brisbane right, okay. are the other That's even better. Are the other team. Fantastic. That's even better. Um, look, g'day to Macca, who's uh, enjoying a bit of family time this week. He's not around, so it's just you and me, Nick. And uh, oh, it's a bit of a rabble. Don't forget, everyone, if you want to join the chat, you can join on Discord. Um, there's links all over the place. Or you can just go to our website, which is now working, uh, aflcrowcast.com. Uh, you'll see the chat box there. Just chuck in a, a name that you want to use, and uh, away you go. You can join in the chat. Uh, and as I said, g'day to everyone on YouTube and Twitch. Right, Nick. What do we do first? <laughs> <laughs> Start oh, with the men. We'd... Start with the men? <laughs> well, yeah. let me just bring up some bloody... No, actually, do you know what I'll do before I start with the men? I'm going to start with oh, something my... else. Oh, the ladder? Uh, no, I'm going to start with something else. Oh. I'm going to I'm going to show you something. Um, Does this mean and... I actually have to look at YouTube? Well, you don't have to if you don't want to. Um, but I'm going to show you something. And... Uh, here we go. Let's see if I can do it. Did that work? No, I'll try that again. Because it didn't work. <laughs> didn't work. Let me try that again. Here we go. Right. That, ladies and gentlemen is what winning a premiership after 65 years looks like and uh, some of you will know uh, my son uh, from previous uh, efforts on Crowcast um, and his team actually won their grand final in cricket today after 65 years Nick 65 year absence <laughs> uh, so uh, not bad naturally stoked and uh excellent they had to it was one of those tricky ones where they had to um chase a very small total and that can be a little bit tricky sometimes so uh, they're only chasing 130 and uh 
they managed to get them with about, I think, four or five down, which is great. So congratulations to Cameron. Congratulations to the Coromandel Valley Cricket Club for breaking their A-grade 65-year drought. They had two other teams in finals, in grand finals too. So uh, uh, excellent work by then. And uh, right, that's enough of that. Uh, Cam's probably half... Well, <laughs> no, there, there's no chance in hell that Cam's listening to this because he'll be well on his <laughs> way very deep very, very deep into celebrations uh, at the moment. Yes, as he <laughs> should. Well deserved. Right. Let's crack into the results. Uh, you know the promise, Nikki. Uh, we go through yes. these really quickly and then we just move on. So yep. Thursday night we had uh, Collingwood bouncing back, although it uh, didn't look as good as what I thought a lot of the commentators were crapping on about and Carlton was shit, can't defend. 16-10-106 to yeah. Carlton 13-7-85. Yep. Margin there of 21. Uh, the Cats, oh my God, we have to spend a moment on this one because that was daylight robbery. Absolute oh. daylight robbery. The Cats getting up by one point, uh, 12.981 to 11.14.80. The Lions getting robbed and uh, gee whiz. Now, uh, absolutely Port, robbed. Oh, were they ever? It was terrible. Uh, Port resounding victory over Essendon, eighteen eleven one one nine. Interesting score there. Uh, to one to nine eleven, which is one one nine in reverse. Sixty five. A margin there of fifty four points to the pair. <laughs> I just love bringing bringing that number up whenever we get the opportunity. Um, Melbourne. Oh yeah, it, it's such a good number. Well, is it ironic that I live in Unit 1, number 19? Unit 1, number 19. <laughs> How good is that? Um, right. Uh, Melbourne, 12, 19, 91, now that I've told everyone where I live. Uh, to St Kilda, 11, 7, 73 there, a margin uh, to Melbourne of 18 points. Uh, the Suns, a good victory over a very... <laughs> there's no way we're getting pick one. Uh, the Suns, 14, 14, 98 to North, five goals, 9, 39. A margin there of 59 points. Uh, Richmond, pretty solid win over Hawthorne, 11, 12, 78 to the Hawks, 7, 7, 49. Uh, really good game this afternoon. Uh, Bulldogs getting over the line against West Coast. Both teams had their chances but Bulldogs, uh, seven more scoring shots, probably deserve to win on balance. 14, 16, 100. There's a 100-point rule, Nick. Uh, to yes. West Coast, 14, 9, 93. And the match in progress right now, uh, it looks like the Dockers are going to get up quite comfortably. Currently, nine goals, 19. Excellent kicking, 73. To the hapless Giants. Leon Cameron isn't going to last the year, Nicky. There's my he prediction. Shouldn't. He's on, I'm pretty sure it's his last year. Pretty sure it's his last year uh, on his contract, or he might have one more, but I don't reckon he's going to last a year. I, I reckon, thought they extended him. Uh, like a year or something. Not sure. Vardy in the chat will be able to help us. Uh, but four goals, 12-36 is not the scoreline uh, that a team as star-studded as that, irrespective of a couple of losses of players, they've still got an absolutely star-studded team. And uh, there's no way in a pink fit that they should lose to uh, Fremantle like that. No way at all. Um, right, so let's just bring the ladder up quickly because probably worthwhile just talking about briefly. Um, so Port comfortably on top. Uh, we've dropped out of the 8 to 11th. Um, Sydney a surprise, starting two zip. They've got a very young, good young team, which we'll talk about, obviously, in a little bit. Gold Coast yep. showing their usual early season form that will drop off at about round six. Um, uh, Brisbane struggling, obviously, at zero two, 2 uh, But other than that, probably as suspected, really, as expected, after two rounds. Yeah, I think so. I, th I think Brisbane are unlucky, very unlucky, with where they should be. Yeah, but it's it it seems to have kind of settled this week. A little bit. I mean, there's some interesting games coming up. We've got West Coast and Port will be a cracker, I reckon. Um, Richmond and Sydney will tell us a bit more about where Sydney are at. Uh, Melbourne GWS. You'd uh, expect Melbourne to start favourites in that one. Um, what's another? There was another one. Oh, Brisbane Collingwood's going to be interesting because Brisbane really need to win that if they're going to get back into the race. And uh, and they're now based in Melbourne. That's right. Well, and, you know, how much that 
impacts them, I guess we'll wait and see, but uh, you would expect that it would impact impact them to a certain degree. Um, yep. Just the upheaval, and, and upheaval to training and recovery and all that sort of stuff. PJ's confirmed um, that Cameron's there till 2023. Yeah, no, well, he might be there according to his... Uh, his salary. <laughs> according to his contract. Um, but uh, no, there's not a chance. Not a chance in hell, in my opinion. Anyway, uh, let's get on to our game, shall we? Because uh, it was a little bit disappointing, I think. Uh, we were expecting a little bit more. Uh, Adelaide 11-22, if you don't mind, 88 points to the Swans, 18 goals, 13-121. Margin in the end that flattered us a little bit, I think. The Swans by 33. Um, oh, look, uh, let, let's let's do the eye test first, Nikki. Let's do the eye test first, what we thought, and then we'll crack into some stats. Um. I was annoyed at the goal kicking, but yep. I really liked the fact that they didn't drop their heads in that last quarter. They were still full going out, trying to play the way we want or way Nix wants them to play. Um, all of uh, like his measures that he wants to see up, we were on top in those. There was that patch in the second quarter where we just lost our shape we looked tired as um all of us were chatting in the the game day chat we had mm. here on discord mm. and it was noticeably apparently a, a quite a warm, warm day in sydney yeah. um and the way that nix wants us to play is very taxing but we then Not came fine, back mate. we fixed a few things I'm no, we, we fixed a few things, but there were still issues and yeah. we need to work on those. I've got massive problems about Rob. I well, think yeah. he's a bit of a liability. Well, it's, he certainly is at the moment. He's not playing anywhere near his uh, best and fairest form. Uh, he got no. uh, towed up in the practice matches against Port. Uh, he had his coloured lo colours lowered in a win against Geelong and uh, Tom Hick Hickey wipe the floor with him uh, and the yeah. big the big problem i've got with riley is that he's not impacting around the ground um and we'll see that when no. we talk about the stats uh but he's not taking any marks uh he's not having any link play impact and uh you know as a consequence um tom hickey uh you know should not be monstering riley like that but he is look i think um, Sydney did to us in that, particularly in that second quarter, what we did to Geelong the week before. They were able yep. to maintain possession, and we simply couldn't work out a way to regain possession of the ball once we lost it. Um, you know, uh, yeah. There's a couple of selection issues. I think a lot of people going on about D Mac. I've got, you know, we know what we know about David, but he certainly wasn't the difference. My, no. I, I felt like um, there was a an issue with selection. I think we went in a little short in attack. I would have liked to have seen a second toll um, because the SCG yeah. is a small ground. It's a short ground. And because of that, you're not going to get the same sort of service as what you um, what you get at the, at the Adelaide Oval, particularly if you're not... Um, you know, controlling the ball a hell of a lot and therefore kicking it a little bit higher. I would have liked to have seen an extra tall up forward um, to stretch Sydney a little bit because they're not an overly tall agree. defence. Um, and yeah, I felt very that, much agree with you. Yeah, I felt that as a result, um, Frampton wasn't good enough to be able to control the aerial contest, which means that the ball was ping pinging out real quick. Um, I feel like if we were able to nullify those contests a little bit more, we could have got some inside 50 stoppages which would have allowed our forward uh, smalls to go to work um, but as it was they were able to defend us very easily in that during that period um, and yeah. uh, uh, you know and look I would have loved to, uh, unfortunately I don't have a stat for scores uh, from turnovers or scores from the back half but uh, my impression was that scores from the back half in that second quarter for Sydney were probably 90% of their total score yeah 
I, th- I think that's what they actually showed up on the screen during the game, that right. a lot of the scores were, primarily most of their scores were from the defensive 50. Yeah. Um, and as weren't, whereas we actually did that a little bit better against Geelong. Yeah. I, I think actually you could see the writing on the wall in terms of what happened in the second quarter towards the last half of the first because Sydney really slowed the game down. Yeah. And we let them do that little chipping around. We didn't get close enough to impact and we gave them too many easy marks. Oh, far too many. Far yeah. too and, many. And that's just basic work rate of, yes, I know we, we were happy to keep them out wide, but it's not really that wide on the MCG, on the SCG. And that's no. how they like to play. So and we that- should have been closer. Yeah, the, we allowed them too many diagonals. They were able to crisscross the ground. Um, yep. And what that does is open up your forward 50 because you're creating new avenues and uh, you're running the defenders ragged trying to maintain, you know, keep up with the second or third lead. So, um, yeah, look, I, I, let's, let, I've, I'll just finish off that by saying that a few of our lads looked a little bit leg-weary in the second quarter. Um, yeah, yeah. Which they shouldn't have been. It's round two. Uh, they've been training all summer. Uh, Sydney's not a big ground. They shouldn't have been run ragged, but that's what you look like when you're chasing tail all day. Um, and I, th- it found a couple of players out. It showed me that Harry Schoenberg uh, needs another preseason to build a tank. Um, I felt like his defensive efforts in terms of his running uh, weren't up to scratch. Um, Agree. S- similarly... Sorry, go on. I was going to say, well, he's reaching for tackles where he needs to get that little bit closer. We know he's got a burst of speed, but he just kind of thinks, it seems like he thinks he can make the tackle with his arm reaching. He's got to get that little bit closer just to really make sure that they can't break it. And even if he's, okay, they might get a disposal away, but being that little bit closer gives a bit more body pressure and often that will affect the disposal, even if you don't get a clean tackle happening. Yeah, and, and I, I think that's... that's what I noticed against, he did it against Geelong as well. Mm, I, th- I think that's a result of just a, a lacking a uh, little bit of explosive pace. Harry's going to need to work on that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, look, he did some creative stuff and we'll go through individual shortly, but I did notice Harry, um, Lockie Murphy uh, and uh, Ned McHenry's defensive running, uh, and Shane McAdam for that matter, who d- looked like he shouldn't have played Shane McAdam actually, he looked properly on that ankle, um, but they offered no defensive work. Jimmy Rowe offered no defensive work out of the back half. Um, so we didn't look as um, rabid as what we did against Geelong, particularly after quarter time. Um, and uh, yeah, it we, just shows... Yeah, we, we did for that first half of the first quarter and then it kind of disappeared. Well, we had the ball a bit in that first quarter. Sorry, that's my phone going off. Um, we did, because we had a bit of possession in that first quarter, um, you know, like I said, we weren't chasing so much, so we didn't look as fatigued. And when yeah. the ball's in front of you, you tend to, uh, you, you tend to look a little bit quicker. <laughs> Um, but in that second quarter, uh, it you know it was just blow the siren, please. <laughs> we're cooked. Oh yeah, so. we, we all were like halfway <laughs> through the quarter, going, when, "Where's the siren going? We we kind of need half time." Yeah. Um, so they were the two uh, uh, main issues for mine: lack of def- defensive pressure in the forward fifty, um, probably lack of an additional marking target to challenge Sydney uh, as we we're going into forward fifty and. Uh, you know, just that stretch of time where we couldn't dispossess them, and that'll come out in the scores, in the stats. Let's just have a look at some of these stats. I, I will. Um, I will just say that's a lack of defensive efforts in the forward fifty, unless your name is Taylor Walker. Well, that's true. Yeah, but I'm talking about their run out of defence. Tex, yeah. um, you know, uh, Tex was fantastic, and we'll talk about that. But let's just have a look at uh, a couple of things to try and illustrate that. But I, I want to touch on, first of all, our um, our contested possession. Our contested possession um, rate uh, was pretty good for the match. Um, but then when you look at the one percenters, uh, Sydney flogged us in one percenters. So 
they were doing the extra things that we were doing last week against Geelong that we weren't doing this time. We weren't doing those extra little things um, that, you know, just force a turnover or force a stoppage or what have you. Um, uh, the one that I really want to show, though, is uncontested possession. I don't know whether you're looking at the screen, Nick, but for those watching on YouTube and Twitch, uh, have a look at that in the second quarter. Absolutely destroyed us in the second quarter. They were double our uncontested possessions at half time. Double. And that's where the game was won and lost, in my opinion. Are you there, Nick? I am. Uh, Right, yeah. No, I just agree with you. Yeah, no, I think you're dropping yeah. in and out a bit. Um, so, yeah, uh, and look, that's just what we described. Um, uncontested, they got control of the ball. Uh, they were able to transition easy. They were using it by foot. If we have a look at uh, um, their kick ratio in the second quarter, they out-kicked us by half time. They were out-kicking us by... Uh, you know, 40-odd kicks. Uh, the kick-to-handball ratio, let's just have a look at their kick-to-handball ratio. Uh, where are your handballs? Yeah, 137 handballs to uh, 239 kicks. Uh, not in the same stratosphere. So they were 2-1, to one, basically, kick-to-handball. Um, and, yeah. it sh and it showed... That's how they used and and the they were and it was very much those slicing kicks, just yeah. breaking the ang the angles and and for a lot of it it was getting it through the mid the center. Yeah, and you can see that in the in the lower graph of of just graph time in possession, um, you know they had possession for fifty one percent of the time up until half time. We only actually had possession of the ball for thirty three percent of the time. Now you can't do much when you're only having possession of the ball for a third of the match. And that's where we were at at half time. Um, so they were controlling the ball. They were controlling. And the flow on effect of that, Nikki, was that when we were getting the ball, we were in a hurry and we weren't doing the same to them. We weren't trying to break yeah. them over with chip path passes and slicing runs. We were going back to the old dropping it on someone's head at centre half forward. Um, and you know, and that's where that's where we needed, I think, a bailout under those circumstances. We didn't really have one. Frampton um, probably showed why why he's down the pecking order a bit uh, this week, um, and therefore they were just able to bounce it out again. Uh, what else is there? Disposal efficiency. Oh, that's no good. Let's have a look at. Uh Disposal efficiency on the bottom graph. You can see the actual disposal efficiency was pretty even across the across the match. Um, just just on that graph there. But if you then have a look at inside fifty disposal efficiency, it's a different story. Um, and again, inside fifty efficiency was where we, uh, if you recall, last week we were up around seventy percent inside fifty efficiency. Now they weren't anywhere near that rate for us. Um, but they were certainly uh, far higher than us in terms of inside 50 efficiency. Yeah. Um, you know, up around the 50%, we were down around the 40% at half time after being even uh, in the first quarter. So, you know, uh, a lot of the other stats, when you go through it, um, you know, clearances, uh, we beat them in centre clearances. Overall in clearances, uh, we also beat them quite comfortably across the ground so um and our contested possession as i put up before was fairly even although they did get ahead for periods during the second and third quarter it wasn't our endeavor around the contest it was what we did with the ball once we had it as opposed to what they did yep. with the ball um you know um and you can see just just in straight disposals, um, they dominated us. They were eighty five up on disposals at half time, ended up about sixty one up. So we certainly railed that in after half time. Uh, but really, the second quarter was was the match. After that, it was you know whether yeah. we could stay in it or not. Um, is there any other stat that really 
uh, stood out to you, Nick? Um, from watching the game, I thought that yeah, to, to me was it was those centre clearances which you've talked about, and it, it was the issue of the we hadn't really taken any contested marks or even any overhead marks mm. uh, for a lot of the game, um, yep. and that really really stood out for me. Um, and I and I think Rob, to me, it feels like Rob's got a hand injury or something. Um, and oh, hand injury doesn't that's... stop you from running. No, it doesn't. Um, but that definitely, I think, is probably affecting his his marking, etc., or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. J Max said the goal kicking stat, Fiend. <laughs> it's like, yeah, <laughs> that wasn't well, good. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it wasn't good. Um, but that's what you get when you're under pressure. I mean, Sam Berry probably there was probably two out of the four that he should have got. Um, Sam Berry. And, and you think, yeah, those, those shots he had in the the second quarter. Yeah, it was uh, what is it like three points? Hmm. Um, that I think that would have changed a bit of the complexion of the game if those ones had got. But he seemed to really like kicking between that point post and that goal post. Yeah, on the left hand um, side. <laughs> oh yeah, that's his favourite spot. It's like somebody tell him between the two really big ones, not between a big one and a little one. That'd be good. Yeah. Um. So it. To me, that's why, whilst I was annoyed in the third quarter because of what had happened in the second, when I kind of thought back on it, going, okay, yes, there's still some problems, but we knew there were going to be problems this year. But I kind of felt, I didn't feel as bad as I thought I would mm. with that result. Uh, look, I think, I think a few people got found out and we might just go through yeah. uh, some individual stats I think um, because some people definitely did get found out by um, by a different style of game I, I, I felt when we played Geelong last week I actually felt like they hadn't adapted to the new rules at all uh, through no. arrogance or probably lack of good coaching um, <laughs> uh, both <laughs> Both, both is good. Pro, pro, yeah, yeah, probably. Um, but uh, Sydney have adapted very, very well um, to uh, the new style of game, uh, which I think the new style of game I think is in part uh, as a result of the standing on the mark. But I, I actually think that um, I actually think that coaches are, are adapting. What I what I fear, Nikki, is that we're going to get to to about round three or four, and Coaches are going to see that teams are going to get a run on like we did against Geelong and like Sydney did against us where you just simply can't get the ball from them. And what do coaches yeah. do when you can't regain possession? What do they do? They flood. Yeah. They flood. And the issue with that is if we get coaches starting to flood to bottle up forward lines then that's going to cause Mr. Hocking to want to put in zones like they've put in in the bloody VFL. And uh, I don't know whether I'm going to be able to stomach that. <laughs> oh, well, no, the other thing that got me was, and I really noticed it in our game, was that whole standing, the standing uh, rule was even as soon as a player had the ball and had the mark. And if you hadn't gotten onto the mark yet, the umpire yelled stand. Hmm. So the player had to stop even if they weren't directly on the mark. Yeah. And it's an and interesting one, that one, I Nick, think because... They, sorry to interrupt you. Um, I think they did that. Yeah, and interestingly, I noticed in the Richmond game previously, uh, the other night, that Richmond weren't actually running up to the mark. They were, they yeah. were allowed... They, they stood back off the mark, which obviously allowed them to move east-west. Um, yep. Now, whether the umpires have been had been told as a result of that game that they needed to pull players up and make them stationary, irrespective, I'm not sure. But there was a substantial I, that's what difference. I felt. Yeah, substantial difference between, pardon me, how the mark was administered in our game, for example, uh, versus that Richmond game, um, and I think that's the reason. Um, you know, are, are we? As we move forward, are we going to see teams just not stand the mark? 
uh, we're going to see teams have uh, players and, and standing I, I 45 that... degrees to the mark either side. You know, almost forcing a player to kick where the mark over where the mark is, but not actually guarding the mark itself. If you watch the women's game today, our Crows women's player actually do that quite a bit, that they will actually stand on the angle and yeah. say, we want you to kick out wide. Yeah. They, they will not give you the corridor. Mm. Um, yeah. And I think that's, that's incredibly smart. Yeah. Um, and they're at least still allowed to move. Yeah. Um, on the mark, but I, but I think that's what's going to happen. And, and I do think the smartest thing is what Richmond were doing, which is you don't 100%. actually stand on the mark. You stand a bit behind it. A hundred percent. It was very good coaching, uh, and very good execution by the, uh, Richmond players, because that's exactly what you've got to do. You've got to stand off them. That standing off the mark is where you get your freedom. And, um, you know, if that's the way that you can maintain some sort of mobility on the mark and guard, you know, certain directions or make it more difficult, then why wouldn't you do it? But I don't think Hawking's going to stand for it uh, because no. obviously this rule is his baby and the AFL will be loving the high scoring at the moment. And and the other thing is also when it's a kick in from the boundary line, players are supposed to, they're supposed to bring the player on the mark five metres in. Now, they did that for one of their kicks so that gives that player freedom to actually then run in yeah and keep running forward whereas when we got a a kick out on the boundary line they put the sydney player right on the boundary line yeah and i'm like um hang on no 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 that's not the rule yeah and it it was just the umpiring was driving me nuts in this game but from what i could also see very obviously from the start of that quarter was they got the phone call about that missed holding the ball the night before and they were so hot on it. Oh, 100%. 100%. No no way in the world does Tex get four holding the ball decisions, even though they were all there. And the, I actually... Yeah. It, it could well be a blessing in disguise, that uh, robbery down at Cadinia Park, because it could actually force umpires to make calls around incorrect disposal. Um, irrespective Which, of where the ball is on the ground, because we've been screaming about this for on this podcast for years. <laughs> that yep. you know the the bulldogs and the and the cats and the tigers they get away with throws left, right, and centre because they just let the ball spill out of a tackle. So I yep. look, it, I feel terribly sorry for Brisbane in that game, but um, if it has a silver lining that it forces umpires to actually make decisions then uh, so be it. The, the other issue that I've got with the standing the mark rule is I don't think the umpires are positioning themselves properly. I think there no. needs to be an umpire behind the player. You know, you've got three umpires, so you've got one forward of the player, you've got one administering the mark. I think then the, the third umpire who's behind needs to put himself in such a way that as soon as he sees that player, particularly in a, in a set shot for goal, as soon as he sees that player run off the line, then he calls yeah. play on. Um, and and for that, if they, he's standing there directly behind there, the player that is on the mark is going to see those arms go up straight away. Exactly, exactly. And they can then move. They're not waiting for the whistle. They don't have to look sideways yeah. to take their eyes off the player to get the play on call. That's um, that's exactly right, Nick. Um, and, and the and visual is, cue is better than waiting for the play on call from the, the umpire. Yeah, and the problem is that, unfortunately, because of Gary Hocking and who Stephen he's Hocking. put in charge... Oh, Stephen Hocking. Um, who Hocking. he's put in charge of... Oh, whatever. <laughs> One of them, they're bad. Yeah, um, yeah. Of umpiring is, is not somebody who was an umpire. So their positioning is so incorrect. You've got three of them. And the reason they put the three in was that you could actually space them out so that even with all the congestion and everything else, that if they were in the right positions, one of them has a clear view of actually what is happening at the contest. Yeah. And can give... My, my other thing is, can you please allow boundaries to actually umpire? They know the rules. They actually have to yeah. do the same training as what the field umpires do because the field umpire goes down, a boundary actually can come in yeah. and fill in. I, I don't know about and that. Often, anyway. No, but they often have a better view. 
yeah of what's I, I, going on from that angle. that's a that's a discussion for another podcast but uh um the other thing that was inconsistent with regards to that is that like one shot for gold Tex got called to play on and he hadn't moved more than a millimeter off the line and yet buddy was doing his usual arc so uh, i don't know yeah. anyway let's move on from that and look at some individual stats shall we because uh talking about umpiring goodness me let's uh go through <laughs> uh, who do we have? i want to have a look at ben keys first of all um you know we go um benny keys a lot going on there from ben he Ooh. picked up in the third and the fourth i thought he he was very much quiet in the second along with others yeah something's just happened to my graph it's not working <laughs> <laughs> well we had to have oh, something go wrong rude. um uh just keep talking while i fix this nick <laughs> One of the players I'm going to be very interested in is Scholl um, because I thought he very much went missing and whether it was the way that Sydney played him to keep him out of the play, the SEG is a narrow ground and he likes to use the width. Mm. So otherwise I think it's something he's going to have to learn to actually work on a narrower ground and also work around getting a heightened attention yeah. on him. I, I, I contrast him with Seedsman. I thought Seedsman actually had quite a decent impact, um, whereas you, know, you hardly saw Scholl at all for the whole game. No, Lockie, um, Lockie struggled a bit. Um, yeah. And I, it's a pity this damn... I don't know what's going on with this damn thing all of a sudden. Um it used to work. Let me just uh, get that out of there. No. Uh, that's interesting. Um, Lockie Scholl, I think, only had like... Um, I think he only had... Like, hang on, I'm going to have to bring up the bloody AFL stats because uh, I'm not going to be able to get this to work on the fly. Um, Lockie Scholl only had where's his meters gained he ended up with 306 meters gained but he was down at half time to about 80 yeah. or something he, he did pick up in the second half i think towards the end of the third i think it was um but it was it, yeah to me it was very noticeable how out of the play he was mm. Yeah, um, when, look, when we I needed him, they blanketed a couple of a couple of our playmakers. Um, <clears throat> they blanketed um, um, Brody Smith as well. Yep. Uh, let's see what's happened. That sucks. Yeah, Smithers did some nice things, but I agree, not enough. And they, well, they made him defend very well, much yeah. so. His, his, uh, uh, Brody's impact on the game from a meters game perspective was, um, was down as well. Um, Seed had about 400 odd meters gained, um, which, uh, wasn't too bad. Um, but yeah, uh, Brody was, we weren't getting any value at all from, from Brody, which was a pity. Um, but they obviously done their homework on a couple of our players and uh, worked out where... Oh, that's annoying the crap out of me. Um, worked out where our drive was coming from um, and they really shut them down. They did some work on Tommy Lynch. Uh, Tommy Lynch wasn't able to generate anywhere near the influence uh, that he had the previous week. Um, so they, you know, it wasn't just a case of them... Um, playing well they also put some some homework into uh into our our setups and where we were actually coming from keep talking nick i'm going to try and fix this well one of the other ones uh, they're talking about in the the chat is mcpherson um i thought he 
initially I, I li- quite like the idea of him and the matchup on Heaney, mm. but he got sucked into bodying. And that's not McPherson's forte yet. He's more evasive. Um, he he does, doesn't have that strength. And, and Heaney was able to exploit him in those respects. Um, the other one I thought was Dude was just continuing on being Dude. Um, and I noticed in the third and the fourth quarter, it seemed that he was more minding Heaney um, and kept him uh, quiet. Hamill, as well in the back lines, got caught out a couple of times, but I, I thought he played a really solid game um, and gave her that, that another step forward of how what we know we're going to get a really nice um, halfback defender from him. Yeah. Yeah, I thought Will Hamill played really well, actually, because um, uh, he had a bit of a nullifying role, but he also... Um, no, I'm just not going to be able to get that to work, which really annoys me. Um, he um, had a bit of a nullifying job, but he also... He was proactive. Was proactive when he needed to be, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think... Uh, let me just have a look here as I regroup. Yeah, and... Yeah, there's a couple of times like he just gets the arm in, yeah. just that hand in to interrupt, and it's it's really well placed. And so there was that one he needed to get a little bit stronger on that hand. They got a goal when he really should have just dumped that over the line, but he just kind of missed it, and it was a bit of a softer. Um, I found it. Touch. I found it interesting that um, they didn't play Dude on Heaney more. Um, yeah, I felt like that was a natural matchup. Um, you know, people were going on about DMAC selection, and um, I felt that the reason DMAC was in the side was to allow us to match up better on their more dangerous players, Papley and Heaney. Um, but I, I just don't know whether they got that those matchups right. I would have liked to have I seen once, today a little bit more started, on that. Once they started, there was less pressure on that midfield bringing the ball in. Hmm. I, I think there was you, you saw it in the first quarter because they did get the ball down there a little bit at that start of the first quarter but you had Duday just really nice intercepts and I think Hamill as well one other time so we were able to put that pressure on so it was a lot harder for those for Papley and Heaney and then McDonald and um, Buddy to, to yeah. get that the easier movement that they like once they got it clearer through that midfield and there wasn't as much pressure and they were able to get those deep entries, that's where it didn't help us, mm. particularly in that, in that back line. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think you're right. Uh, but again, I think it was the midfield that really hurt us more than anything else. Yep. It, yep. it seemed to me to be... Uh, and it was in general play, which was interesting. It, um that's that's the bit that worried me a little bit. It was in general play. Um, just just giving them too much space. Yeah. Where they should have been just that little bit closer, which would have just put that body pressure on, which is what we did against Geelong. We didn't give them that space. And Sydney also liked to do that out wide and then bring it in. Yeah. And we did it well against Geelong. So it frustrated me that we just kind of gave them too much space. It was It was a basic thing. Yeah, but I don't... Was it a structure thing, do you think, Nikki? We definitely lost structure in that second quarter. Very much so. Um, that was so noticeable because of... We'd get it out from the back lines and it would just immediately come straight back in because we were sucked in too close to the contest and mm. midfielders were too, too close to the defence and they needed to be back that little bit. Um, it, and they also sucked in our forwards, uh, which didn't help. And yet watching the game last week against Geelong, there was, I think we, we were just able to to keep our spacing really well, whereas a number of times I saw two players go at one and one of them would actually wave the other player away to go, no, 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 you need to cover that other one. And they'd ignore it and they'd still come on. And, of course, the Sydney player would then overlap to that free player yeah um 
and to me that's where the, that kind of the loss of structure came about, which was also a, a loss of actually listening to your teammate. Yeah, I, I mean, what do you think that they did differently after quarter time, after half time to to because it didn't appear like they actually put players behind the ball. No, it was still kind of the the same thing, but I, I think there was they got that little bit closer. They didn't give them as much space. Mm. They were they they upped that pressure, um, and I think that helped in being able to that Sydney often were then more bringing it in wide than they were th- so easily through the midfield like they did in the the second quarter, and then. And that's just that little bit of tightness. And it's just, you know, we, we've just got to get back and win that one-on-one contest. I, I think that was a, that kind of that simple message, which Nick's after he got the talking to last year, was like, keep it simple. To me, that's all it kind of seemed to be. Yeah, yeah. It's just get in there and get the ball. Um, there, were, there were still a couple of occasions, though, where I was yelling at the television of we were – reaching for the ball a little bit or we were paddling it instead of just running through it. Um, and you could just see that Sydney players seem to want it more, which is that, that old adage we've all heard from our footy coaches, you know, want the ball, body line it. And yeah, there didn't seem to be the aggression at the ball that yeah. there was the previous week. Yeah, that that's, that's to me what was noticeable was that, that we weren't willing to body line the ball as much yeah now Nikki I'd just like to say that while you've been talking about some very important issues <laughs> what have you done <laughs> well, I, I fixed my fix I actually redid a pivot table um, refreshed all my data and uh, it's pretty right so keep talking for another minute or so and we'll be good to go <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god! Bloody pivot tables in Excel. Ah! Yeah, no, <laughs> I've been fighting with them at work all week. <laughs> uh, uh, what do you think about um, Buddy's return? Oh, could they shut up about it? Well, yeah, there's one thing. <laughs> I kind of got sick of them. Oh my god! Buddy's kicked three. Buddy's kicked three. That's nice. Walker's kicked six. Yeah, that's Walker's right. leading the goal kicking. By the way, that's 100 percent right. It drove me insane. I mean, um. Yes, he played well. He played exceptionally well, yeah. no doubt about it. But uh, could we just shut up? But I thought it? Butts actually played him really well. Yeah, yeah. I thought Geordie played really well, actually. Um, in fact, I thought both Jordan and... Um, Murray? Uh, Nick Murray acquitted themselves really well because they were, they were quite exposed at times with the way the ball was coming in. Yeah. Now, check this out. Um, and, and, and also... No matter what Jonathan Brown would say about, but that's Buddy's natural arc. Well, that's nice. That's his natural arc. But too bad. You step off the line. It's play on. And the umpires yeah, actually can call it. 100%. Cool, play on. I do, and bullshit, that's his natural arc. That's his natural arc to get that distance. He cannot kick that distance if he actually runs straight. No, that's right. It's as simple as that. Whereas that, Taylor Walker can. Yeah. Um I agree, 100%. Uh, right. So, let's have a look at some individuals, Nick. <laughs> hey, oh, finally! I'll talk about doing something on the fly. Um, so, Benny Keys. Benny Keys, and I'm still going to be doing stuff on the fly while I'm <laughs> while we're talking. Um, How would you see his game? Uh, up and down. Some good passages, but he's still got that issue of the finishing. Yeah. That he, we just need to polish off. There were some really great moments of you know where he did actually body line the ball, yeah. and that desire and that will. But there's other times he went a little bit too quiet. Needed to to lift. He needs more composure. And he needs, yeah, and I was about to say the the other thing was needs more composure. Like we we need Ben to be able to actually take his opportunities. Um, because it's damaging. And it's a bit demoralising for the opposition when you get a situation where someone breaks a line, 
runs into the forward 50 and uh, all of a sudden um, you know we don't get a goal out of it and the ball starts bouncing back the other way and that's that's the big problem it's the ball coming back the other way at pace and all of a sudden um, you've got a situation where everyone's out of position and I think that contributed quite substantially to um, what was going on half the time so Benny Keys um, he had now that I've fixed my charts he had um, 10 in the uh, 10 disposals in the first half 18 disposals after half time so uh, an excellent return there um, his contested his center clearance work he had two up to half time and two in the third nothing in the last which was a bit of a shame uh, but around the ground he had uh, or overall he had five clearances in the first half and three in the second half um, so you know from the, in that respect he was very good his uh, score involvements um, he didn't wasn't involved in any scores in the first half but he had eight score involvements after half time five in the last quarter so he was uh, indicative of the effort that continued after half time to try and get, get us back into the game um, uh, where was I looking for contested possessions um, yeah so 10 contested possessions for the game too so Another pretty solid effort from Benny Keys in terms of work rate, um, but he's. I don't think he'll ever be the player, Nicky, that we rely on for polish. No, and and that's not why he's there in the team. I, I think no, hundred percent. We, we know we're not, not going to get that from him. Yeah, he's he's not, um, and that's fair enough. But there's nothing stopping an AFL level player from being able to kick a goal from forty meters out on the run either. Yeah. So from that perspective, you know, he needs to do better. Um, I thought um, Rory Laird was probably our best midfielder. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Your, your, to your tone of querying that then as you said that. Was he really? Well, Maybe, I think. It's, it's um, again, it's, it's the defensive efforts that concern me. I mean... Leddy had 11 disposals up to a half time. He had another 11 in the third quarter and eight in the last. Uh, so finished, um, you know, with 30 odd disposals. So you can't knock him for getting around the ball. Um, he had good clearance numbers. He had, what's that, 10 clearances for the match. Um, his contested possession count, particularly after half time, was good. I reckon he might have got a bit of a rocket because he only had four contested possessions up until half time. Had 10 yeah. in the second half, uh, six in the last quarter. So, um, you know, but it's that second half number that bothers me uh, because Rory's a senior player and that's where we needed uh, some pressure to be put on the contest or, and, and on Sydney's midfielders because they were just waltzing away with it. Yeah, he needed to, he needed to be the one. Well, him and Sloaney. In that second quarter. Yeah, mine. him and Sloaney. Yeah. See, again, no score involvements up to half time for Lady, um, and nine score involvements after half time. So my read is that the midfield has got a bit of a rocket. If we have a look at, say, uh, Rory Sloan, I reckon we might find similar uh, statistics. Sloaney yeah. had, uh, you know, a better dis disposal count uh, during the course of. Um, the match more even he had 12 in the first half and nine in the second half but again you know if you look at his score involvements only two score involvements up to half time and only um six for the match so that's not enough that's not enough and and part of that he, he was parked in the forward line for some of those in the last half well yes yeah, so you know i mean his um clearance work um was good in the first half but fell away um, he had five in the first half, only one after half time. Um, his contested possessions, uh, seven in the first half, four after half time for a total of 11. So, you know, not 100% sold on Rory's uh, game. Um, and again, it shows a bit of a, um, you know, if you have a look at Sloney's meters gain, for example, um, you can see that he did you know contribute there that's what 400 meters game and uh, 200 meters going in the first half and about 107 to 160 in the second half but 
were they all just nothing link plays was he actually being creative was he actually instigating play or was he just a link in a chain do you know what i mean yeah and and for me if i want to see those stats what i also want to see is his opponent's meters gained because he's giving his opponent he was doing it against geelong and he did it again against sydney he gives them too much space especially Especially really close to the 50. Well, their let's, forward have 50. A, let's have a look. I just want to show you a couple of numbers. Um, where is he? Braden Campbell. Braden Campbell in the second quarter went crazy. Him and um, I think it was Florent. But Braden Campbell had 17 disposals up to half time. His metres gained was off the charts. Let me just have a look. So he's had. What's that? Three, four hundred and fifteen meters gained up to half time. Seven hundred odd meters gained for the match. Now that's and that's Laird or that's really, Sloan's yeah. direct opponent. Yep. And whilst that's very acceptable for Sydney, that is not acceptable for our defensive side of our midfield, which is where we're still struggling. Well, and if you have a look at uh, those disposals, a lot of those were uncontested. When he had yep. 14 uncontested possessions in the... So he just got off the chain in the first half. Um, on the outside, he had 10 uncontested possessions in the second quarter. Ollie Florent was another one um, who just knocked up getting the ball. Ollie Florent had eight uncontested possessions in the second half. You know, his metres gained... Similarly off the chart, his score involvements, you know, five in the first half. Braden Campbell's score involvements, you know, he had five for the match. So these kids were, were not, they, they were link players and they were the, they were the two, uh, along with JP Kennedy, um, who I'll just chuck up now while we're at it. JP Kennedy had an excellent game too, I thought. But they were the, they were the players that were linking up through the midfield. And they were the players that were hurting us. It was those sorts. Luke Parker was another one. Um, but Braden Ca Ca uh, Campbell had an excellent match, I thought. I actually almost would have had him best on ground, to be honest. Anyway, yeah, let's get back to cool. us. Let's get back to us. Now, let me just show you Lockie Scholl, uh, who we were talking about before with his um, being down... <clears throat> Uh, he had eight disposals up to half time. He had eight disposals in the third quarter, none in the last, um, which was a bit disappointing. If you have a look at his metres gained, um, they dropped right off as well. He had 145 metres gained in the first quarter, then 87, 74, and sweet bugger all uh, in the last. So that's not good. Nettie McHenry was another one uh, who I felt struggled um, in terms of his output. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, only had the five, <clears throat> pardon me, five disposals in the first half. He had eight after half time, six in the last quarter. Um, Ned's disposal efficiency was pretty average though, 33% in the first quarter and nothing over 52% for the game. So Ned's, um, Ned's ability to hit targets and, um, you know, actually cause some damage not so good his tackles inside 50s number he only had one for the game he only actually had one tackle for the game now you compare that to last week and that's a different player yeah very different player you know so uh, Lockie Murphy's another one where if you have a look at Lockie's tackles he had three tackles for the game uh, none inside 50 um, so I mean if you actually have a look who contributed to our tackles inside 50 um we had uh, Shane Jax McAdam. Would be the top one. At Tex Walker. Um, Barry. Walker's had four. Yeah. So, you know, not a lot of tackles inside 50. In fact, our total tackles inside 50 for the game was uh, only 13. Uh, so our... Our pressure in general just wasn't up to scratch. Um, Harry Schoenberg's another one. Sorry, pardon me for a second while I just get myself organised here. Uh, Schoenberg, 
with his disposals. Um, you know, six in the first quarter was a really good start, but then only one in the second when we really needed him to be putting on, in some work. And uh, Shuey actually stood out to me um, particularly um, as being lagging behind on a few occasions. It, you know, he came back a little bit in the in the second half, had seven posies, um, but probably not enough defensive output. He only had three contested possessions for the game, which we need more from uh, Shuey. Um, he only had four yeah. score, score involvements for the game. Um, you know, and con considering he was sharing his uh, time with Sam Berry up forward, uh, we needed more score involvements from from him. Speaking of Sam Berry, just have a look. Um, not a great follow up game for Sam. And he had the seven, uh, the yeah, the seven disposals, five in the first half. Um, two in the last, um, and again, if you have a look, um, score involvements. He had three score involvements, which are those points. Well, all his score involvements were direct scores, so he wasn't involved in any link play. Um, you know, his contested possession count was only five for the match. Um, I don't. He had two clearances in the last quarter, so you know that's what you're going to get from kids, Nick, isn't it? You're going to get that inconsistency. Yeah. It's going to be up and down. Um, it's going to be interesting to see Nix's response to this game and whether we've got some others that can possibly step up for next week. Um, and the problem is the SANFL hasn't started yet. And whilst, yes, they're playing trial games, that's not the same as an actual SANFL game. No, and it does have a bit of an impact. Yeah. Um, I've just put up metres gain from our two main drivers of halfback, Brody Smith and Paul Seedsman. Now, Seedsman has obviously um, <coughs> outshone Brody quite substantially. Um, Brody Smith only had 13 metres gained <coughs> in the first quarter. Um, seed 189, uh, 106 to 181 in the second. 81 and 86 respectively in the third. The ball spent a little bit more time in our forward half. And then Smith came a little bit good, got freed up. Maybe they swapped, who knows. But uh, Smith 150 and Seed 64 in the last. So they're, the, they're not the numbers. They're not the numbers that we got from those blokes last week. Now, the other bloke that got held a bit was Tommy Lynch um, in terms of... Um, you know, his direct impact on the play, like his score involvements last week, if you remember, were off the charts, but he only had, what's that, five, seven score involvements for the game. Um, not nearly as much uh, impact. Um, he only had five inside 50s for the game. You know, so where we need Tom's in the side to be the link player, to, to get lots of score involvements and give us lots of inside 50s. Uh, and we didn't get that from him at all. Yeah, think, they very much restricted him. Well, do you think that that was Tom being down, or do you think that they put work on him? I, th I think it's a bit of both, because we, we've seen that before, that when other teams put work into him, he goes into that shell. He, he, has, he does struggle Yep. get around that. And... And I thought it was better last year of actually moving him onto the wing, letting him play up higher. Yeah. And that could get, that used to get him involved with the game, whereas he didn't. I didn't notice him go onto the wing at all. He still just stayed in his yeah. in his half forward. Look, well, I think which it's... Even though, yeah, he does go that high half forward. He doesn't go as high as when you put him on the wing. Yeah, I, I think it's a measure of professional coaching that irrespective of, of a person's performance the week before, you need to select and you need to structure up for an opponent and for a venue. And, uh, you know, as I said at the beginning of the show, I didn't feel like we actually structured up terribly well. Um, and Lynch's role could have been uh, interchanged with another tool and we could have played Tex higher. Um, I'd love to have the stats for where our shots on goal were taken, but I'm sure that they were taken further out from goal this week. Uh, certainly our entries into yeah. forward 50 were coming from deeper 
um, last week our, our effective forward 50 entries were coming forward of center coming from forward of center whereas a lot of our inf inside 50 entries this week were shallow and they were coming from behind center with a long kick um, yep. you know uh, and that's I think where we could have afforded we could have afforded to play text deeper and maybe gone with a with a, a two tall forward line with McAdam playing a cameo um, you know, and, and Schoenberg and Berry and, and whatnot running around at their feet. Um, so I don't know whether we necessarily structured up well for uh, the venue and for the opposition that we were playing, do you? No, I agree completely. And, and, I, and I think you're right, we should have had that extra tall up forward. And because the other thing is that we know that those 50 metre lines at Sydney are not 50 metres. Well, that's right. They're not. They're, they're actually in the square. Mm. Um, and so having those those extra tools, I think, would have created a bit more dynamic in that forward line. And particularly yeah. when Sydney slowed us down. Yeah. And we started to go back to that bit of that bomb, that would have helped better. Yeah, I mean, and you can't. Uh, I don't. You can probably. It's probably asking a bit much to select for, um, you know, for losing for a losing position. But I, I felt like we didn't have a lot of options. We couldn't really change up our forward structure terribly much. I think we we had what we had, and we were kind of stuck with it. Mm -hmm. uh, Tex Walker, though, speaking of being stuck yes. with things. We are stuck with this Tyrannosaurus Tex, as someone labelled him the other day, <laughs> and he's just shooting the lights out. I mean, what a game. He had 15 disposals. Um, you know, uh, his uh, contested possession work. Like, when was the last time you saw 10 contested possessions from Tex Walker? Um, before the knee. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and despite uh, play, being our main goal kicker, he also contributed, particularly in the second half. He had 280 metres gained in the second half, which shows that he was up and back, up and back. And we saw in, in the coverage a few times, you know, he was well down back um, helping out. So, you know, uh, you know, four tackles inside 50, which basically all resulted in scores, Um you know, just an immense game from Tex. Just an immense game from him. Oh, you know, th three goals either side of half time. Fantastic. And and he honestly needs to get votes in that game from those umpires. So it'll be very interesting to see if he does. But he utterly deserves them. 100%. That very last, that very, very last holding the ball where he corralled and the way he corralled the player in to nail him was, I. And he's m laterally moving. 100%, Nick. You took the words right out of my mouth there. His ability to move laterally is something that we haven't seen from Tex for ages. And that little piece of play showed exactly where he's at in terms of his his body. Um, because I haven't seen him being out, be able to move side to side like that for a long time. Oh, yeah, we, we haven't seen it for... Cause, and it's so obvious that he was playing restricted for the last two years. Yep. Just seeing it, how freed up he is. 100%. Um, what do we do about that? <laughs> um, That's the million well, dollar question. I, what do we do about I that? Know. And I'd love... I'd love people in chat, and uh, if you listen, if you're watching this on de on demand on YouTube later on in the week, or uh, you know somewhere that you can put a comment down, I'd love to hear people's views on what we do about this situation with Tex and Fogarty. What do you reckon? Is it? Oh, to me, it's an interesting one. That when I was looking at it last week, and I was looking at that forward line, I like Tex being in there because the rest of the forward line was very young and you still need a mature head yeah. in there during a rebuild. Now, he's not going to play the game all the time because he, do he does need to come off um, and rest, etc. So I, th I think that's where you can bring in 
a Tilthorpe or a Fog. Um, although I think Tilthorpe probably needs to possibly come in for Frampton next week. I would be interested to see what they do. But the problem is we've also got Rob struggling and Frampton's kind of our backup ruck. Um, well, do you ruck Himmelberg? I, do you ruck Himmelberg? And, well, actually, um, I don't... Yeah. And give I Rob a mind. breather. I like Himmelberg as a ruck, but I'm not quite sure where he's at because the whispers are that there's some fitness issues. Yeah, well, um, he had a he had an interrupted preseason, and he's yeah. behind the behind the eight ball fitness wise. I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they brought in Strawn for for Rob um, to give him a spell. Yeah, um, but I maybe not this to. week. Um, but, oh, but do, getting, do it get, against North. <laughs> yeah, get, getting back to the Tex Fog question. Um, yeah, it's a conundrum, Nick, because we time's running out for Fogarty. It's his fifth season now on our list. It is, and and the thing is that he's had chances, but he hasn't taken them. Um, and we know there were some issues last year, so we can kind yeah. of. understand you know there were some things going on there that might explain why mm. but he needs to have taken those chances and he just doesn't have his head in a game for a full game he goes missing every so often and he does that a little bit in the SNFL um yeah. as well he has patches where he's quiet and you could see he needs he needs to get involved more but it often it's often somebody else has to give him the push to do that um, which is why I've liked him when they've put him in the midfield in the SNFL because he has to stay involved. It's just, and, and Nick's talked about playing Fogg in the midfield in the trial and I don't know how he went, whether he got a bit of it and all the rest of it. He's never going to be a midfielder, Nick. He is never going to be a midfielder. That's a dream that needs to be let go. Yeah. He is, he's a lead-up forward. Um, he, can, he, he can do midfield in the SNFL. Yeah, he's but, done it very nicely in the SNFL. It's in the yeah. ALS so, so different. I, I'll get back to the question because we haven't really answered the question. You know, Tex is in career form, in my opinion, uh, and the game yeah. as it's currently being played uh, suits him down to the ground. So completely, you know, on form, he's pretty much first picked at the moment, Tex Walker. But I, we are, I agree with you there. But we are not. In our in the stage of our development cycle, where wins are terribly important, you know clearly you you go to win every game, but what's more important is that we start to configure our next contending side, and Tex Walker, unfortunately, unless a miracle happens, Tex Walker is not going to be part of our next contending side. You know, Darcy He's Fogarty, not. Darcy Fogarty, simply from an age perspective is in that demographic where he if he comes up will be part of our next contending side but at the he's been on our list now for five years but the big issue there was if he comes up and I has don't, he I honestly think, been I, given I, the I, opportunity he has previously when we were actually playing well and yeah, but we still had Tex in the side, though, it. Nick. We still had it's, Tex in the side. We did, and but you've actually seen with him in Himmelberg that Tex and Himmelberg can work quite well. Tex and Frampton last week worked quite well. Two um, different players. You've 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 got a tall you've got a, a tall marking forward and a lead up forward. For Darcy Fogarty is a is essentially Tex Walker. They are pretty Himmelberg's much the a lead same up player. Too. Ah, uh, but he's a marking. He's a marking forward. If, but he's he's very good on the lead. He is a lead up forward as well. Yeah, I understand that. But we're talking about where we're playing them positionally, and essentially, you need to play Fogarty in the same position that you're playing Tex. You can't have them. I've said this for ages. You cannot have them both in the same team. So, what do we do? Because well, Tex. But, will not last another couple of seasons and will have burnt Fogarty out by then. My problem with Fogg is I actually don't think he is going to make it. 
I and just don't think he has it between the ears. That's a fair call. That's a fair call because um, there's not many players on many lists that have... And, you know, he's a bigger boy, so they take a bit longer, etc., etc., etc. They do, but he's got all these fabulous attributes. Mm. And he burst on that scene. I just still remember that Richmond game where they actually um, put what's-his-face on him and he, and he towed him up. Bloody what's his he face? Oh, the, the, the apparent all Australian defender who actually didn't really defend. Um, <laughs> him, that one. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Um, it's been a long week. <laughs> yeah. And, and and you could just see that that's what it was. And, and he and Tex were actually working really well together. And they weren't, sometimes they were on at the same time and sometimes one was on the bench and the other one was in the, the forward line, which gave us a different dynamic at times in our forward makeup, which was good. But he so, just hasn't come on from then. So I've, I've got to say uh, that the consensus in the chat seems to be uh, that Fog may not make it. So a lot of people are agreeing with you. I'm not hundred yeah. percent I'm not hundred percent sold yet. I, I'm still of the view that Fogarty has not been given enough opportunity uh, a, a, an appropriate run of games to without Tex in the side to be able to hone his craft. I really don't think so. Um, I think yes, he's been in the side when we've been playing well. Um, he's uh, other players worked in tandem with Tex, etc. So I, I've said this since the beginning of the season. If Tex is playing well, I, I would prefer him to stay in the team and for Tom Lynch to be dropped or played in a different position and for Tex to play that high half forward role and for Fogg to play deep. But I really do not think at this stage that Fogarty has been given enough of opportunity. And I wouldn't be surprised if he continues to languish in the twos that um, there's another team around that would love to pick him up. Um, now, the other one is... Yeah, no, I'm agreeing with PJ. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. that's... And look, it's six and one half a dozen at the other at the moment. It's a real quandary. Um, it, and... it is, and I really actually want to see what's going to happen in the twos. I, I want... That. Yeah. I really want that SANFL. Because even though, particularly with a forward... There's some things you can forgive and everything else because of the difference between the SNFL and the way we play as an AFL team as opposed to our SNFL opponents. But you can still get some idea because that's what I could see with Himmelberg and everything else, even though he he wasn't producing those efforts in the SNFL, Mm. but you could see what was there and how Mm. that would work in the the AFL. Uh, My problem is I don't have a form guide on Fog. I can mm. only go on the little that we've seen so far, and I'm really disappointed. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, time will tell. And I, I don't guess. want to be disappointed in him because he has so much ability. Yeah. Well, he's got a lot of natural ability, um, but like you said, that's not everything. Has he got it between the ears? Has he got the drive? Has he got the motivation? Um, you know, is it just that he's just not quite up to it? I guess we'll find out, but I think this year is the crux year for, for Darcy. Um, yeah. And as PJ points out in the chat, we've got Riley Thilthorpe. Now, he's a yeah. you know essentially a number one pick. Um, could be anything. I've actually been disappointed that they haven't played him already. Played him yet? I disagree yeah. with anyone that wants to play him in the ruck. I don't want to play Riley Thilthorpe in the ruck. Um, no. Nah. I, I want him to play, play him on the forward, forward or on the wing. <clears throat> I don't know, play him on the wing. Play him up forward, for God's sake. <laughs> I like him on the wing. <clears throat> yeah, but it, that's, yeah, that's silly. Um, but we saw against Sydney what playing a young forward around experienced forwards can do, and Logan McDonald did not look out of place at all. No. So I'd be disappointed if Riley... I mean, I'm happy if they want to give Riley one or two SANFL games, but if he's not in by the mid-year break... I'll be disappointed because I think we've just got to play him. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, Anything else you wanted to cover off, Nick, before we finish up on this game? I'm just trying to think who else. But I think we've kind of covered most that needed to be 
talked about. Yeah. And we've yeah. and we've talked about Rob earlier, but yeah, there's something going on there. Yeah. Uh, look, I yeah, apologies for being um, uh, for having that snafu with the graph, but uh, I'm actually pretty proud of myself that I was able to fix it on the fly <laughs> to do that whilst I rambled. <laughs> Macca oh, would have yeah. been proud of me. Yeah, well, there you go. Um, look, let's just quickly talk uh, about next week. We've got um, uh, Gold Coast. We got Gold Coast. Yep. Gold Coast. Gold Coast here. So, what can you see happening in terms of selection, Nikki? I, I think there definitely does need to be some changes made. Um, no injuries from the game. No declared injuries from the game, anyway. There's no declared injuries, but will Hinge be available is going to be interesting with his shoulder. Because yeah. I really liked him. Yeah. And, and I think I think if he hadn't have been injured, he would have still been in this week. Great. Um, and, and we need somebody of his size down back uh, with the loss of Kelly. Because um, will Kelly still be out? Well, twelve days. So, one. twelve days. So he would be past the protocol. Um, yeah. But there's no real word on on how his recovery is going yet. And he's got a broken. Yeah, it's a broken nose. Well, um, you can play with a broken nose, but if you still you, got you concussion can. symptoms. Yeah, and the the other one is Vardy Magic's raised brown. You know, because we actually haven't heard anything. No, not at all. About um, what that injury is. Yeah. Um. Shane, Shane McAdams an interesting one because I felt like he played with a bad ankle on uh, the weekend, and I don't think yeah. Shane's very good at playing with injuries. No, I, I don't. I don't. I think injuries affect him. Um, so you know, uh, and, it'll and be I, interesting to see how he comes up. Yeah, I mean, he kicked four. He got involved towards the end, even playing with that. So you could see, you know that quality that he still has but yeah but no defensive I, I work think, at all no and and that's one of his highlights so mm. it might be a good idea to give him a rest um I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to this game because i think with what the suns have produced and particularly what they produced against north uh, i i think we're not quite at sydney level but we're a little bit below them so I'm very keen to see where we are ranking in terms of where the Suns are. Um, well, I, I, know, I, the midfield's going to be interesting. I've gone so hard so early so often for uh, for bloody Gold Coast, and I'm just not prepared to call it just yet. <laughs> no. They, they keep they tease. They're the ultimate teasers. Yeah. They show glimpses and you go, oh, they're actually stepping forward and then they're, they're falling in a puddle. Mm. So they're anyway, uh, we're, that's uh, that's uh, possible force changes. Can you see any unforced changes? Can you see any change in strife? I think Lockie Murphy is in a bit of strife. I didn't like his game at all on the weekend. Um, yeah, I think, it, yeah. I think he might be in a bit of strife. Um, I think... You know, I, again, I don't have a read on how the practice match went on the weekend, but I, I reckon we'd be fairly keen to give Luke Peddler a run sooner rather than later. I don't know where he's sitting yeah. in terms of his fitness levels. Um, you know, uh, it would be a really good test, I think, for Riley uh, Riley Tilthorpe to come in. Um, uh, but it'll be interesting to see whether they stick with Frampton, whether they bring Himmelberg in, or whether they whether they go with uh, Tilthorpe. Um, aside from that, probably the only uh, other one... Well, there's Haightley as well. We haven't well, seen Haightley yet. That's what I was going to say. I just wonder whether they might give Jackson Haightley a run and give young Sammy Berry a bit of a break for a week um, and see what Jackson can do uh, in tandem with Schoenberg. So I could, yeah. I, could see a few, I could see a few unforced changes this week. Uh, we did look a little bit sluggish. Um, you know, we've pl- we've had a uh, by all reports a very hard preseason in terms of training. Um, you know, Which the young needed. legs young legs might be feeling it a bit. Um, J Max saying that Haitley's injured, so that would rule him out. Um, but yeah, so I, I wouldn't mind betting that we see a couple of uh, mix and match uh, things happening. Um, even young 
Tariq um, New Church. New I wonder Church. Whether they, I wonder whether they might give be tempted to give him a run um, ahead of Lockie Murphy. That would be interesting. Yeah, a different look up forward um, and a bit more speed. I mean, Mur- Murphy's... People actually forget that Murphy is actually not slow. He's, he's, he is quite quick. Um, but, it, yeah, Newchurch would give us a bit of a, a different dynamic because even though he is that smaller player, but the way he plays is different. Yeah. But let, let's just not forget that the main focus is to get players uh, games into players that we think are going to be our, our future. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Lockie Murphy... Oh, I'm not sold. I'm not sold on Nat McHenry yet, although I've loved his endeavour over the last couple of weeks. Um, but I'm still... I, he was terrible with ball in hand. Terrible. Uh, I still think he lacks uh, some composure. Um, and I just don't know. With his size, uh, he's yeah. going to have to be a Caleb Daniel type, and I don't know whether he's yep. got that in him. Oh, Vardy Magic. Thank you. Jimmy Rowe was the one that we haven't spoken about. Yeah. He had a shocker. He had a shocker, yep. Jimmy Rowe. Second, um, second game blues. Well, is it second game blues or is it playing, playing against a better opponent or a more organised opponent? You know, we've all had stars in our eyes about Jimmy and I've loved his uh, work rate and his ability to break into the team and I love what he brings... But the query has always been on his agility and his overall fitness. And, gee, he looked all at sea. All at sea against Sydney on the weekend. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how he backs up. Anyway, look, let's finish that off. Um, I reckon we get up over Gold Coast by a couple of goals. Um, and I reckon... I, I think we will. Thilthorpe, I reckon Thilthorpe comes in. I reckon it's the game. Yeah, we, we, we need a, a bit of a, a lift before the game. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, quickly, let's just talk about um, our... Our minor premiers. Women's, our fantastic women's team. 4 7 to 2 5 17 against Collingwood. Takes us to the top of the ladder. Um, takes us straight into a prelim final. Um, you know, there was some worries or concerns about our... our uh, a couple of lax performances, but geez, we've come good at the right time again. And I think the girls have just been playing for the end of the season. I think they're ready oh, yeah. to go again. And Clarkey has been, you've noticed he's played most of the players on the list. He's rotated through. Yep. Yep. And I think our team today was close to what we'll go into. I think that's probably what we'll go into the um, prelim with. Dana Cox coming back into the back lines was absolutely sensational. Um, she beat Chloe Malloy in the first two um, little encounters they had. And Chloe Malloy is an absolute dead set superstar, particularly up forward. Yeah. And Cox just made her look second rate in those two um, little endeavours. It was an absolute pressure game. Hence the, the score line. Mm. We missed some easy bloody shots. It drove me insane. <laughs> so th- that actually should have been more. But we controlled the world. Surface is, we didn't play well. We actually did play well. We countered and pressured Collingwood because that's exactly how Brisbane beat Collingwood is you pressure at them. So mm. it's not pretty football. Mm. Um, but then when we got that break, except for Ebony Marinoff, kicking three times to the same player in the, the back lines who was loose who read the ball quite well. Like, Ebony! Um, but I also liked Clarkey was um, Tani... I'm trying to remember her. Uh, her married name now. Um, Naylor, I think it is. Um, she was go up against Remat Cuff because she's a jumper. She's quite high in being able to jump and bring the knee up. And as soon as he brought on Caitlin Gould volleyballer she can jump as well and actually out jumped her he switched up who was our lead ruck in a way and that really stopped them um so that was nice to see that that little way around so we're either going to play Frio or Melbourne 
and Melbourne has Daisy Pierce with a knee injury, so that's going so to be interesting. Is it is it five and six and three and four, or does Collingwood play Kangaroos and Melbourne play Frio? Yep, Collingwood play Kangaroos, which right. is going so, to be interesting, so line, and then yes. they play Brisbane. Yeah, so um, you'd see you can't see Kangaroos losing that, uh, winning that, and the Melbourne Frio game is very interesting because Frio. Oh. Frio, despite their, um, you know, their good form at times and their good form against us, um, you know, they've lost three out of the last five. So, um, yep. um, yeah. And early on in the season, for Frio, it was very much, it was the drive of, you mm. know, we should have won the premiership last year. We mm. have unfinished business. But mm. when we played them, we had the same scoring shots. Yeah. And when we changed it up and went back to playing our game plan, in the last quarter, we came back at them. Yeah. And we were close um, in the end. And I think that Clarkie was trying a few things. And it wasn't... We weren't playing our game plan. We were playing a game plan to stifle the opposition. Mm. And that didn't quite work with the girls. And as soon mm. as he got them back to... No, no, no. We structure up our way. We play our way. Yeah. Um, a, I'm worried about playing Melbourne. I'd rather play Frio, I think. Actually, on the opposite, I think I'd rather play Melbourne because Melbourne can't defend. Um, Frio can shut you down. Um, but I don't think Melbourne are as good at shutting you down. So I wouldn't mind Melbourne winning that game. Uh, Collingwood will win the other one. Um, you would expect Brisbane... or the Brisbane-Collingwood game would be a really good one, actually. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I can see us playing Brisbane again in the, in the GF and... Uh, and just making it a lazy dynasty for Aaron Phillips. That'd be nice. I mean, she's yeah. she's literally on one leg and can't kick at the moment. No, um, but she's still better than half the girls in the bloody comp. Oh yeah, true. And and they and they put so much focus on her. So it's allowed Hatchard. It's allowed Marinoff. We've got Tia Charlton goes through the midfield. I love Rochelle Martin. Oh my God, that little pocket rocket. <laughs> she tackles you. You stay tackled. Yeah. Um. It's just such a really nice mix he's got. And particularly up forward, we don't rely on one player. Yeah. And no, that's what makes us so damaging. It's very exciting for the girls. Um, and Nikki, uh, we should leave it there, I think. Um, look, thank you We've to everyone. Enough. We've done enough. Done enough. Thank you to everyone who's joined us <laughs> in the chat on YouTube and on Discord and on Twitch. Um Thank you very much to all our patrons. We've had a couple of new patrons come on board um, in the last couple of weeks, so we really appreciate your um, your support. I'll drop the statistics into into the uh, Patreon page after the cast. You'll also get a sneak preview access to a player interview that I'm uh, doing tomorrow. So, patrons, uh, you'll have access to that uh, interview, and uh, obviously, we'll run it next Sunday on the weekend wrap in the meantime nikki thank you very much for joining us well otherwise it would just be you yeah no and that's boring as hell <laughs> <laughs> thanks it's everyone good to chat footy with you fan lovely so likewise uh, nikki fantastic uh, we'll see you all next week guys